Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, 10 Don'ts of eDiscovery. My name is Billy Burnett, and I'm a Marketing Manager at LexisNexis, and will be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to review. First, this webinar is not intended to be legal advice. Second, this webinar is being conducted in listen-only mode, so there's no need to worry about any background noise on your end. Third, all attendees will receive a copy of the slides and recording of today's webinar. Fourth, since you are in listen-only mode, in order to ask any questions during today's webinar, please utilize the chat box in the ReadyTalk window as indicated on the slide here. Finally, we will have a short poll question at the conclusion of the webinar, and upon your exit from the webinar, a brief survey will appear. We certainly appreciate in advance you taking a moment to fill that out to provide us your feedback on today's session. Next, I'd like to briefly introduce LexisNexis and uh, most importantly, today's presenter. So LexisNexis litigation solutions portfolio helps law firms and legal departments streamline all phases of the litigation process. For eDiscovery, Concordance Desktop handles processing and reviewing, and for case management, the case map suite helps with fact management, timelines, and presentations. Also, most importantly, again, is to introduce today's presenter, Mr. Michael Mallory. Mike is an e-discovery and litigation technology consultant working with industry leaders and litigation professionals to raise awareness of changing technologies, workflows, market trends, and best practices. Mike was a litigator for 16 years in New Orleans before moving to Washington, D.C. in 2005 and passing the patent bar. Mike received a JD from Georgetown University Law Center and a Bachelor's in Computer Science from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Mike is also a certified e-discovery specialist, so he's the perfect person to lead us through today's presentation. And with that said, Mike, I will go ahead and pass it over to you to get started. Thank you very much, Billy, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I do appreciate you taking the time and the interest in eDiscovery to join us for this uh, webinar. Um, we did a similar webinar back in May, and just so that you get an idea, if any of you participated in that webinar, uh, Billy and I were talking about ideas and how could we uh, talk about the things that are the most important in eDiscovery, particularly to the people who are on the phone today. Um, and, and Billy came up with an idea of, well, why don't we figure out some don'ts, some things that you really shouldn't do in the world of eDiscovery. And I had done a, a, a webinar like that previously, and so I'm certainly familiar with the concept. And it, it does in some ways put the information that we're going to discuss into, the, into a different context of, wow, I really need to make sure that that's one of the things that I just don't do. Uh, some of the materials that we're going to cover today, we did cover in May. Uh, we will cover them in a slightly different format, in a slightly different way. There will be additional information. It certainly is, is, is not a bad idea to cover some information twice, especially since the, the aim of this is to surface for you the most important things about uh, the universe of e-discovery. As Billy mentioned, this is not legal advice. We will be talking about cases. We will be talking about best practices. And again, the purpose of this was to surface for you the things that are going on in the e-discovery world, the conversations that are being had on blogs and at conferences. Uh, but certainly, you know, make your own decisions, do your own research, and hopefully what this does is it gives you a way to kind of dip your toe into a particular area. Uh, and then you can, you know, do what you need to do from there when and if that issue ever comes up. So with that as context, these are the topics uh, that we will cover today. Uh, we do have it in terms of 10 don'ts of what don't do, what you shouldn't do in e-discovery. But the general topics that it will include are reasons to pay attention to e-discovery, the litigation hold and collections process, the meet and confer, getting help on e-discovery and e-discovery issues, Hosting, culling, which uh, may be a concept that uh, you may not have come across before, and of course social media. 
And like I said, uh, some of the materials that we'll cover in social media are very new. We did not cover them uh, in May. Uh, we will have an opportunity for questions at the end, and I think Billy mentioned that if you do have questions, certainly send them in as they come to mind. At the end, uh, we will cover those questions. I believe it's after you do the poll. So with that, let's jump right in. So 10 don'ts of e-discovery just for context. And why are we talking about e-discovery? There has been an explosion of electronic documents. Think about the, the days uh, or back in the day when the amount of documents you had was limited because you were limited by physical space of physical documents. Back in the day of paper, or maybe when you highlighted on paper and wrote notes on legal pads, things like that, uh, there was only so much information, so many documents that you can manage. These days, with uh, the computers and thumb drives and uh, storage, you can store and access a whole lot more information. And here's just some statistics. 2004, 90% of documents were electronic. Typical flash drive can cover up to 9.6 million pages. Typical desktop, up to 604 or 48 million pages, 640 gigabytes, 2.6 billion email users, 205 billion emails sent, and there's a forecast of 6 to 7% per year increase in email accounts worldwide anticipated through 2019. Now, this information probably does not surprise you. It's probably one of the reasons that you're on the webinars because you realize that there's just a lot of data out there. This one uh, did kind of help to put it into context for me. And this was written by Michael Oxfeld, and this is a treatise that uh, is available on Lexis. And this is a quote uh, that he made back in 2011 where he said, transitioning from paper to digital form has resulted in the proliferation of ESI, electronically stored information. That's the way that the federal rules refer to it. Doubling your client's data every three years. In other words, when he wrote this in 2011, client data doubled by last year and will double again by 2017, by next year. That's a tremendous amount of data, right? So, don't number one is don't ignore e-discovery. Why? Because there's a lot out there, but also because some of us may behind the, uh, be behind the learning curve. Let's say that you get this request for production. Oh, you, come in, you come into the office, get your cup of coffee, sit down, and this is in your inbox a forensic file of all near-line, residual, offline data, native formatting, slack space, legacy data, removable storage media, hard drives, floppy drives, CD-ROMs. What do you do when you get something like this? Somebody told me once, phone a friend, call somebody. And we are going to talk about that in a minute. There are resources, places you can go, people you can talk to about it. But I bring this to your attention because, you know, we are, especially those of us who may not have worked in the e-discovery industry for long, when you come across that first big case or you come across that kind of a request for production, what do you do with it? Here's some of the ways that attorneys have dealt with it, perhaps in a way that was not the best. Uh, in Martin versus Northwestern, of course, this is 2006, 2010, so hopefully things have gotten better. This is, uh, there were sanctions for failing to comply with a discovery request. When the court said the claim the counsel was so computer illiterate that he could not comply with production is frankly ludicrous. So the defense of, I just judge, I just don't know what all this e-discovery thing is all about, doesn't work. In GFI, outside counsel simply did not understand the technical depths to which electronic discovery can sometimes go. Sanctions for failing to supervise a collection and preservation of ESI. That one, it looks like the attorney did try and get involved, but just did not understand the scope or the depth or the technology that was involved. Uh, recently, there was an amendment to the model rules of uh, professional conduct, including that to maintain the requisite knowledge and skill, a lawyer must keep abreast of changes in the law and its practice, including 
the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. The risks associated with relevant technology. So even ethics rules now are pointing us towards needing to know what e-discovery is all about. We need to get out from behind that learning curve. So what is the thing that what are the potential problems? What could happen? Sanctions is the big one. Uh, back in December, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure were amended so that there is now a new sanctions rule, Rule 37E. If you deal with sanctions, that is where I would start. That sets out a framework of uh, initially if there is just prejudice, then the sanction should be no more than to cure the prejudice and that the, the, the killer sanctions such as presuming that the lost information was unfavorable to the party, an adverse inference, instructing the jury that it could presume that information was unfavorable, dismissing the action, or entering a default, according to the rules, should only be used when there is an actual intent to deprive another party of the information to use in the litigation. Uh, there, is all, there has been discussion, however, that courts still retain their inherent authority, and that under that inherent authority, they can sanction as they need to and step outside of this uh, framework set forth in Rule 37E. There is also talk of contempt back in 2010. I'm broadcasting this from Washington, D.C. This was close. This was in uh, Baltimore. This is uh, Judge Grimm. And what did he say in his case? This is Victor Stanley. The defendant's pervasive and willful violation of serial court orders to preserve and produce electronic evidence constitute the single most egregious example of spoliation Spoliation meaning the destruction of potentially relevant information or evidence that he had encountered in nearly 14 years on the bench and shall be treated as contempt of court. Defendants shall be imprisoned for a period not to exceed two years unless and until he pays to the plaintiff the attorney's fees and costs awarded. Now, of course, in that case, he did pay, didn't have to go to jail, but as soon as the words contempt and jail were out there, a lot of people perked up and started paying attention. So there are sanctions that can be awarded, not only against the parties, but also against the attorney. And we're going to see some examples of that as we continue along as well. So what are some of the things that are at risk? Reputation and market competition, dissatisfied clients, sanctions, disciplinary actions, malpractice, bad press. We're talking about market competition. We certainly don't want to be one of those attorneys that has one of those types of opinions written about us, that a position we took was simply ludicrous or anything like that. All right, so number one, don't. Don't ignore your discovery, and the fact that you're on this webinar means that you're not ignoring it and that you are taking that first step to try and understand uh, what it's all about. Number two, you don't need to go it alone. Right? Some of us are not that up to date with all of the e-discovery issues and all of the nuances that may come about when we get that one or that first or that only even big case. So to put this into context, this is the Electronic Discovery Reference Model, the EDRM. And what it does is it puts into buckets each of the different activities that are in the e-discovery workflow. So on the left, information governance. And these are generally handled by the client or a corporation. Information governance is what the company, for example, does with its information on a day-to-day -day business basis. Once there's a litigation hold, it has to identify, preserve, and collect potentially relevant information. Typically after that, or historically, law firms get involved. And you, you process the information so that it uh, can be ingested into a review tool. You then review it, you analyze it, you produce it, and then at the end, as evidence, you present it. And if you'll see the yellow section on the bottom is the volume of documents. Your whole mission is to go from having a lot of documents to a very small amount of documents. And the relevance of the documents becomes greater and greater as you move to the right-hand side of the EDRM, of the workflow. Now, law firms have started to get into the left-hand side of the EDRM, not only because there are duties, and we're going to talk about some of those, there are duties for the law firm not to simply rely 
for lawyers not to simply rely on what their clients tell them. But there's also some lawyers, law firms, who uh, specialize in e-discovery, and they're available to work with you, to co-counsel with you, to handle the e-discovery part of it if it's something that you feel may be over your head. There are also many consultants and service providers that can give you assistance and give you help in e-discovery. We're going to talk about some of the specific ways uh, a little bit later on. So you don't have to go it alone. There is help out there. There is also many materials, blogs, et cetera, that you can read either online or through uh, research services that can help you get up to, up to date on particular e-discovery issues. Number three, don't neglect the litigation hold, right? As soon as there's a reasonable anticipation of litigation, we must slap down a litigation hold to stop the document destruction policy that is likely in place if your client is a litigation, not a lit or is not is a corporation. If your client is not a corporation, then uh, let's say an individual, then you also have to advise, counsel, and make sure that that client does not attend, does not destroy, preserves, holds, preserves potentially relevant information. So, what are some of the things you can do? One is put it in writing, put the litigation hold in writing. And this is one of the examples where there was gross negligence and sanctions for failing to issue a written litigation hold. Now realize that these sanctions uh, uh, cases, most if not all of the cases that we talk about today were prior to the, uh, the amendments to the federal rules back in December, but they still uh, can be looked upon as the best practice to follow. There was a discussion in that Chin case, Chin versus Port Authority, that in some cases it might not be necessary to do it in writing. It's not necessarily gross negligence per se not to do it in writing, but the knee-jerk uh, uh, rule of thumb is make your litigation hold letter in writing. Proactively comply. Make sure that your client is proactively complying with the litigation hold. Identify the key witnesses, custodians, and IT personnel. Instruct them to preserve in writing. Confirm that the written litigation hold letter has been received and understood, and then periodically reissue it. As time goes by, the litigation hold may change, it may shrink, it may grow. And so reissuing that, periodically reissuing the litigation hold letter is, is very definitely a best practice. Review the document retention policies. We call them document retention policies. They're really document destruction policies, right? That says after three years, you can get rid of some these types of documents. After five years, these types of documents. But the litigation hold stops that process, stops the document retention policies and processes so that those potentially relevant documents are not destroyed. Review the computing infrastructure and create a data map. What's a data map? I've seen all kinds. I've seen them in Excel spreadsheets. I've seen people doodling on pieces of paper. It could be something as complicated as this. The, the purpose of a data map is to map out where the potentially relevant information lives. Whose computer is it on? Whose server is it on? What, uh, you know, what files, what, uh, what drives might it be on? What PSTs or email accounts might it be? Where might it be stored in the cloud, et cetera? All right, so that's an example of a data map. And document your actions. Don't rely on the face value of client statements that discovery is complete and accurate. A best practice is that you cannot delegate to uh, either a vendor or to your in-house counsel or to your client uh, the responsibilities, your responsibilities, that when you sign that discovery response, the responses are complete and thorough. So don't rely on the face value of your client's statements uh, and document your actions. Document the basis of any decisions that you made as to how, uh, what, what to put under the litigation hold, what the scope of the litigation hold would be, why some things were included or were not included. Document all of that so that you can go back to it if you need to, and make sure that there is a reasonable explanation as to why you're taking each of those decisions. Number four, as we mentioned, 
don't rely on your client or your vendor. Clients, for example, are also behind the learning curve. Now, these uh, surveys were done back in 2011, 2012. Perhaps the information is better. This is the most recent information that I could find. Uh, maybe these numbers have gotten better, but back in that, at that certainly at that time, only 85% of organizations had formal records management records destruction programs. 20% didn't include electronic records. 32% didn't include email. 76% didn't include voicemail, and 86% didn't include social media. 30% of the organizations, this is who responded to the survey, didn't have a formal legal hold program, even more kind of a, a gasp. And this one, I mean, I'd hate to put somebody on the stand who's going to testify to this. Only 12% of those who responded to the survey were confident that if challenged, they could demonstrate that their ESI management is accurate, accessible, complete, and trustworthy. 12%. So as a practical matter, may not be the best idea to rely on your client, especially you know, if, if they may not have the, the, the level of expertise in the discovery. Uh, you have a duty. You as outside counsel, we, or say as outside counsel, have a duty. Have a duty to supervise. Have a duty to check their work and make sure that the information that they're giving you is accurate. No longer can we just put blinders on and look at what they gave us and say, shoot, thank goodness there's no smoking gun in there. Sanctions for failing to adequately monitor, oversee, and supervise the collection and preservation of ESI. Qualcomm, fairly uh, popular or well-known case. Outside counsel and the client were sanctioned for failing to oversee document production. Sanctions against the counsel were later set aside because they made significant efforts to comply with their discovery obligations, but there was a lack of candor, persuasive, pervasive miscommunication, and incomplete document searches by the Qualcomm employees. And the last one, peerless. Sanctions, this deals with a vendor. Sanctions for taking a hands-off approach to collection and relevance determination. The defendant cannot place the burden of compliance on an outside vendor and have no knowledge or claim no control over the process. The uh, bottom line on this is that you have to get into your client's business. And if you use a vendor, you have to get into the vendor's uh, work to make sure that they are doing things the way that they need to do it. Quality checks. A lot of discussion about quality checks. So, number five, don't rely on your custodians. What is a custodian? A custodian is somebody who potentially has uh, relevant information. And, of course, you do need to rely on custodians and perhaps people who are not necessarily custodians, who don't work with the data on a day-to-day -day basis, but may manage the servers, manage the system. And those are the two sources that you typically go to when you're throwing out your litigation hold. What documents, what data should we be placing under the hold? Usually the hold is very broad. Don't rely on them, however in going through each of those files and determining which ones are actually relevant. And I'd also say that when they tell you about which files or which uh, locations, which email stores, et cetera, should be placed under the litigation hold, check it. Check it and make sure. Make sure that the information they're giving you is correct. Now, as far as them deciding what's relevant and what's not, here's an example of Jones. The defendant was grossly negligent in relying on employees to select and preserve responsive documents, it is unreasonable, the court said, to allow parties interested employees to make the decision about the relevance of such documents, especially when those same employees have the ability to permanently delete unfavorable email from the party system. Another reason that self-preservation is not a best practice, and this is from Judge Shindlin, who is one of the, uh, the well-known jurists and commentators on the discovery. She says, it's not necessarily that there's bad intent, but most custodians can't be trusted to run effective searches because designing legally sufficient electronic searches in the discovery or, in this case, was Freedom of Information Act context, is just not part of their daily responsibility. They don't do this regularly. They're not attorneys. They're not really involved in the litigation to the extent that counsel would be. And so they're just not... They're just not 
uh, uh, prepared. They're just not experienced. They're just not educated enough to know how they should be going about this, this, this job. So self-preservation is not a best practice. Do not rely on your custodians. And another interesting piece of data is that the 2015 Fulbright study said that 74% of the survey respondents still do rely on self-preservation, even though there is a fairly strong best practice not to do it. Number six, don't neglect the meet and confer. We all know the meet and confer conferences. We all know that we're supposed to talk about the case and talk about discovery. Someone called it once a drive-by. They said, do not make it a drive-by. Use the meet and confer conference so that you can actually get something done, something productive done there. And here are some of the ways that uh, I have seen people using it. And these are the ways that you know, are being talked about out there. One is bring an expert or client representative and that data map. Come prepared with somebody who knows where the data is and what the data is about so that you can have a substantive conversation about the data, about the litigation hold, about production, and perhaps putting some limitations or some scope onto either one. Litigation hold, again, is much broader, and it is expensive to maintain certain information. If you can come to an agreement and limit what is placed on hold, or even limit what is initially produced, perhaps you could produce something initially, a small set of documents initially, and then if it looks like there's a good reason for expanding the production, you can expand the production. Some of the ways that you can limit the scope or set parameters over what the scope of the hold or the production will be is the number of custodians. Uh, again, that corporate rep or that uh, expert might know who the custodians are and why they might be on the list of uh, potential custodians and what information they might or might not have. Date ranges, search terms, we're going to touch on some of this later on as well. There is technology to help you to do that. One of the other things you might discuss to meet and confer is the production format. Most people in the industry do TIP plus. TIP plus means that it's TIP images. In other words, like a photograph of the document. Regardless of whether it's a Word document or a PowerPoint or an email, uh, TIP is a basically a photograph. It's a static, normalized, uh, rendering of the document. Uh, and then the TIP plus, plus means that you're also typically giving extracted text, text that's come out of the documents, metadata, and sometimes other information such as base numbers or custodian names, etc. Do you want to agree to producing metadata? Do you need the metadata? Could you do without it? Is there certain metadata that you do want or you don't want? so that you can limit the amount of time and resources that it goes into reviewing. Again, another good reason to limit, perhaps, the scope of the production as a whole. Uh, can you agree to a load file? If you know that you're using a particular review tool, or that your review tool can ingest a certain type of load file, when the other party is collecting up the information, they may be able to produce it in a load file that you can just uh, load right into your review tool. Uh, you could agree to the timing or phasing of production. Is it going to all be produced at once? If you're dealing with a large data set, you're probably going to want to talk about timing, phasing, producing on a rolling basis. And most of the discussion is that this piece, the meet and confer, the e-discovery part of the litigation, should not be confrontational, should be more collaborative, and can be an ongoing discussion. Your meet and confer happens very early on in the litigation. And uh, setting the tone that this is a preliminary discussion, this is what we believe is out there, and we all understand that things may change as time goes by. Number seven, don't forget the local rules. Uh, you may have heard that along with uh, the uh, amendments to the federal rules in December, proportionality was worked in so that it is now a very significant part of discovery in the definition of discovery. Some local courts have put their own rules in place to try and limit what happens uh, kind of right off, right off from the beginning. This is an example from Judge Grimm, again from Baltimore, the District of Maryland. 
limiting to 15 interrogatories, 10 custodians, not more than five years of information from reasonably accessible sources. His order, his standard order, also says that the, the, the producing party needs to spend no more than 160 hours for searching and reviewing, which includes identifying, collecting, searching, keyword searching, computer assistance, et cetera, and reviewing responsiveness, confidentiality, work pro, uh, product, et cetera, or product privilege, it should say. And if you want more discovery, if the requester wants more discovery, then the burden is on them to show good cause, why it's proportional, why the requester should not pay the expenses, and uh, shifting of the expenses, right? And the court will take into consideration the degree of cooperation shown. The court is saying that you must cooperate in developing search methodologies. You must cooperate at this meet and confer stage. Now, another thing that Judge Grimm had in his standard order is an automatic clawback agreement, which will be effective in this proceeding or in any other federal or state proceeding. So number eight is don't forget the clawback agreement. Some of you may not know what is a clawback or a non-waiver agreement. Uh, those are agreements whereby the parties agree that if I produce privileged information, you agree to give it back to me. And what's so good about these agreements is that all the court has to do is enforce the agreement, right? Some of the advantages that these agreements may give you, in addition to the advantages set forth in the rules, and you'll see there that uh, uh, Federal Rule of Evidence 502 is where a lot of this discussion comes from. But you can get additional, you may get additional protections than the rules provide for you because the agreement may include situations where the disclosure wasn't inadvertent. In fact, there's something called a quick peek. Not very well used, but uh, you may think about doing it, is where you produce everything. You let the other side decide what is relevant, what documents they plan to use, give you the scope of the documents, and then you go back through it and look for anything privileged and pull those back. Not very well used, but certainly something that's out there. Uh, the clawback agreement may include that a party wasn't reasonable in preventing the disclosure. That's a criteria under Rule 502. Or that the party wasn't diligent or prompt in requesting the document back. Uh, if it is incorporated, if the clawback agreement is incorporated into order it, into a, an official court order, and we see that in uh, Judge Grimm's order, it was, it was incorporated in there, it may protect, provide protection in other litigation or against other parties outside of these parties and outside of this litigation. So don't forget the clawback agreement. Number nine, don't forget about hosting and culling. I'm going to go through this part very quickly. Uh, this is kind of a bit of an advanced uh, topic for e-discovery. Certainly if there are questions, uh, raise them and we'll talk about them at the end. As we were talking about the EDRM, you may, as you get a huge amount of data, the first and maybe only time you get a large set of documents, you may want to get some help through consultants or service providers. And one of those ways is hosting. What does hosting mean? Internal hosting. Internal. Most people refer to hosting as external. But if you handle the documents internal, it means that you've installed software, review software. And the software and the data is, say, behind your firewall. That's a great example of what's internal. If you go externally, outsourcing, going to a hosted provider, the software and the data is typically outside your firewall and is hosted by them, and you access it over the web. Typically, you go hosted if it's just a lot of data, you don't have the space. If you want to share and you don't want to allow somebody such as co-counsel behind your firewall. If you want temporary review seats and someone else to do the administration, you don't want to have to go out and buy a document review of software. And in some instances, some firms are able to pass these costs along to the client. It goes from being your overhead to an invoice that you get from a hosted provider that you can pass along to your client. Now, some of the technology that these hosted providers, these service providers, uh, give you, some of this advanced technologies, helps you to funnel down 
and to uh, limit the amount of information that you're actually working with. We talked about some of these earlier. I'm going to talk very briefly. Oh, and the reason is, right, most people will say, and what I have found out there is generally, is that by using what they call culling techniques, you can usually get your document set from 100% down to 15 to 20%. may not go down that far. It depends on your data. But I've heard some people who say that they could get it down to 15 to 20 percent, not by 15 to 20 percent. And what that means is that the time and cost to review, to process and review the documents is also reduced. So let's take a quick look at these two, because these are the objective culling, what I call objective culling processes. What is a hash value? It's a digital fingerprint of a file or document. Adding, deleting, or changing even a single character, changing the font, Adding an extra space results in a different hash value. So every file, every document has a digital fingerprint, and you can see there at the bottom that it's virtually impossible for another document to have the very same hash code. And you can see the chance of two different files having the same hash value in the industry standard, the MD5 hash value, is 340, and all those zeros under the second standard not used as much in the industry. That is 4 billion times less likely to have two documents that have the same hash value. So once you have a hash value, once you can identify, technology can identify a document, you can identify duplicates of that document. You don't have to produce all of those duplicates, and you just produce a duplicate report. Denisting. What is nisting? The National Institutes of Standards and Technology, agency of the U.S. Department of Commerce, publishes a list known, uh, of known computer file profiles. Now, compare, now these are things that uh, are typically pushed out with software that helps the software operate, EXE files, things like that. And comparing this NIST list to your data set, you can remove files that are very unlikely to be responsive, system files, executables from known software applications. When you image a hard drive, you're taking a lot of data out of there, and a lot of it is executable and things that the industry agree, agrees is not relevant. So the NIST list can also be used to, what I call objectively, reduce the volume of electronic data by simply eliminating files that are on the list. So those are two, two very specific ways of limiting the amount of information that you're having to deal with. I call them objectives because they're simply duplicates and then this list. These are the ones that are perhaps a little more subjective. And you may want to include these topics in your meet and confer. Foreign languages. Technology can identify foreign languages. You may agree. You know what? There's a bunch of German documents in there. We just don't need to deal with those. And file types. There may be some marketing PowerPoints that are in there or some Excel spreadsheets that you can agree with opposing counsel. You just don't need those. You don't need to include that in the processing and review uh, portions of this case. Or you may be able to come up with your own rational reason that you need to document as to why that information is not included in the documents that you produce. You need to tell opposing counsel, and if they oppose, then you may need to take it to the judge. Dates, you may be able to restrict dates. We talked about that earlier. Email domains, you may agree that we're only going to uh, produce and deal with emails between the two of us and exclude all other extraneous email domains. You can do keyword searches. You can do cust uh, custodians. You can limit by custodian. And as we said, these are some of the topics you can talk about in the meet and confer. Now, why are we paying attention to this? Because there are some very significant ethical rules, and the rules are listed out there, that deal with things like duplication in this file. By identifying duplicates, and this file, you may avoid reviewing the same documents multiple times and reviewing files that the industry agrees are not relevant, thereby avoiding claims of overbilling your client, yikes, or presenting exaggerated claims to the court and other counsel on the burden and time necessary for review. Uh, judge, judge, there's five terabytes a day that it's going to take me three years to go through all this information. The judge says, have you called it? Have you deduped it? Have you demisted it? No, right? 
The judges are becoming much more educated on this too. They're educated on this technology, and they just might ask you whether you whether you code the documents to come up to a more reasonable size limitation in order to determine the time and resources that it will take to get through it all. All right. Number 10, don't forget about social media. Here it goes. This is sometimes most, most, uh, one of the most interesting parts, social media. Oh, why are we talking about social media? One of the commentators said, for the last decade, email was the 800-pound gorilla in the e-discovery context, often to the dangerous exclusion of other forms of ESI. However, in 2011, and that was what, five years ago, we reached a tipping point with 58% of respondents expecting to manage social media as part of their e-discovery workflow, more than double the amount the year before. Not only is this a massive increase in a single year, but it also moves social media from a fringe element to a mainstream source of ESI. When you're dealing with electronic discovery, you have to consider social media. No longer is it just about email, but organizations must now proactively, and individuals, if you're involved in, in that kind of a case, must now proactively address social media as part of their overall e-discovery strategy. Oh, and the ethics rules and the rules of civil procedure have also changed. They've changed to address social media. In Pennsylvania, lawyers should advise clients about the content of their social media accounts, including privacy issues, the obligation to preserve information that may be relevant to their legal obligation, and how it can affect a case or other legal dispute. So it's not only the legal obligation to preserve the information, right, to go out and collect it, but any any other way that social media might affect the case and your activities as counsel, you now have an ethical responsibility, at least in Pennsylvania, to be knowledgeable about that. New York was not quite as strong, did not put it into actual ethics rules, but guidelines instead. And in guideline number one, as far as attorneys' confidence, they said that a lawyer has a duty to understand the benefits and risks and ethical implications associated with social media, including its use as a mode of communication, advertising to, and a means to research and investigate matters. They also noted, and this is a, an interesting point, that lawyers need to appreciate that social media communication can reach across multiple jurisdictions and may implicate other state ethics rules because the web isn't just restricted, say, to New York. The amendments to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure recently said it's important that counts become familiar with their clients' information systems and digital data, including social media, to address these issues specifically of preservation. We're talking about preservation in that case. So what are some of the areas? We're going to talk about just a handful of them. One is service, right? Service by social media. Uh, 2008, 2009, 2009, 11, and 12, other countries internationally have allowed some substituted service, meaning that you couldn't get service in the normal way, uh, through social media. And these cases dealt with things like an, a default judgment on a loan, summons on a debtor, cross-claim on an investment case. I mean, that one maybe is core litigation. Some of the others, you know, default judgment summons on a debtor, things like that. 2009, great example. The UK allowed service of an injunction via Twitter. It's called the Blaney's Blarney Order. The injunction was to stop an anonymous Twitterer, I think that's a word, from impersonating a right-wing blogger. I think he's something like uh, Rush Limbaugh. His name was Donald Blaney, whose site is called Blaney's Blarney. The impersonator used the same name, the photo from the blog, had links to the blog, and used the same style and tone of writing. The order required the imposter to cease the activity and identify themselves on grounds of copyright infringement. Now, what's interesting, two things. One is that the alternative option, other than allowing service through Twitter, would have been for Blaney to seek a separate proceeding against Twitter in California. He's from the U.K., to reveal the internet protocol, the IP address of the computer that posted the tweets, then ask the inter internet service provider to reveal the subscriber's identity or location of the computer, a very slow and expensive international process. The other thing that's very interesting about this is that this was service on Twitter, prohibiting activity on Twitter. 
because it was probably a greater likelihood that the user would receive notice of the injunction, actual notice of the injunction, before tweeting again. That's internationally. What do you think about the U.S.? Some of the issues that go into this is frequency of use. Does the recipient use the service and is the recipient likely to actually receive notice? And identity. Is the person registering the account actually the person that he or she claims to be? Because on the web, emails, etc., you can create you can create uh, biographies, profiles, Facebook profiles, etc., that may not be you. So if I was to ask, do you think that the U.S. allows service by social media? I'm not going to take a poll, but yes or no. Okay, so it was allowed. 2011, Minnesota, marriage of Jessica Mapathy. I know I murdered that name. <laughs> allowed service by publication via Internet on a husband who had returned to Africa several years earlier. The court said, the rules of civil procedure permit service by publication. While the court considered publication in a newspaper, it's unlikely that the respondent would ever see it. It's more likely that the respondent would receive notice on the Internet. Sorry about this. On the Internet, the traditional way to get service by publication is antiquated and is prohibitively expensive. Technology provides a cheaper and hopefully more effective way. The ways that they allowed service was by email, Facebook, MySpace, or other social media, this is interesting, or through information that would appear through an Internet search engine such as Google. In other words, was he responsible to Google himself in order to find out if he had been served? But that part was kind of interesting. Disallowed. So if you said yes, you're right. If you said no, you're right as well. Fortunato. Credit card fraud required newspaper service instead of via Facebook or email. Since service by Facebook is unorthodox, to say the least, and this court is unaware of any other court that has authorized such service. That was in 2012. Apparently, they didn't see the Minnesota case a year earlier. Some other areas where it's been allowed. FTC, combined email Facebook service. Staten Island support magistrate. One more traditional method of service failed. Mark versus Balker. Use LinkedIn and Twitter to allow members to opt into a class action. So you see that there may be a trend there where social media is being allowed as an alternative substituted service where you can't get it through the normal channels. Collecting, collecting social media. Some of the issues that are out there are these guys. These IMs that say that they're going to disappear once they're viewed, deleted once they're read, self-destructed or does not even create an ESI digital footprint? How do you get that information, or is it gone forever? Here's some of the technologies that are out there to help you collect up eDiscovery, X1 and Read Archives. Uh, Read Archives, I believe, is a sister, full disclosure, a sister uh, corporation or a sister division of LexisNexis. They have public and private. They can get you to the public and private content of social media sites. You can get snapshots of websites. And you can either do it through your own software. You can get X1 Discovery or by archiving as an archiving service where they help you with the chain of custody and they do the work. If you want to get access to Twitter's fire hose, they call it, because there's just so much data, you get it through GNIP or DataSif. And there is something called the Wayback Machine. It doesn't go way back. It goes back to, I've heard, 1996. I've heard it's kind of clunky, not a lot of functionality, no keyword searching. It's the only... Well, only the website and the date that you want to see. But those are some ways that you can self-help and collect on your own. Uh, as far as discovery goes, actually getting, the, the, getting social media information through traditional ways of discovery. Started out documenting these cases. There was a smattering in 2007, 2011, 2012. Trail, I've highlighted. That's a really good one that summarizes a lot of the cases. But you can see even as late as Silva in 2015, there's just a plethora of cases out there now that say generally this. They say social networking content is not shielded from discovery simply because it's locked or private. Even where a party maintains only a private Facebook profile, a court can infer from the very nature of Facebook that users intend to take advantage of its social, meeting, meet its social networking applications to make personal information available to others. Facebook is not used as a means by which account holders carry on monologues with themselves. By its very nature, this is public. Now, mere proof 
of a Facebook profile does not entitle access to all the material on the site, especially the private information. Typically, what you have to do is, well, the courts say fishing expeditions are not allowed. Mere speculation is not enough. Typically, you have to uh, present a factual predicate of relevance. And that is typically that the public portions contain information that suggests that there's relevant information on the private portion. So through discovery. I'm going to go through this part very quickly. There is a statute out there called the Stored Communications Act. It protects providers, people who store information, who store your emails. I'm not going to go through all of these, but they'll be here. Uh, and I believe that we're going to circulate a copy of this PowerPoint, is that you're much more likely to get information through discovery if you're compelling the party through the traditional ways that we get information through traditional discovery. If you're compelling the provider, you're going to run up against this, the Stored Communications Act because it protects those providers from having to produce the information. Uh, Crispin had a really good evaluation where it said the private messaging was quashed, but the public information, and it remanded so that they could determine what the privacy settings were on wall postings and comments, uh, you could get from the providers. So let's finish up with this piece, right? Any misbehaving, who these are the players in the courtroom, social media as it relates to those. There's this guy, attorneys. Assistant public defender in Illinois lost her job after referring to the judge as Judge Clueless and posting comments on her cases. This stupid kid is taking the rap for his drug dealing dirt bag of an older brother because he's no snitch. This guy up at the top, he's wearing a wig, his pictures from the UK. Magistrate resigns, called into court today to deal with those arrested last night and held in custody. I guess they will be mostly drunks, but you never know. And these guys, a lot of discussion these days about jurors using social media during the trial. Mistrial, where a juror admitted to doing internet research on the case. The judge said, shame on you. And then said, how many of you other jurors have done this? Eight others raised their hands. There was an instance in England where a juror attempted to poll her friends to help her decide a difficult case. And here, local, you know, somewhat local to me here in D.C. and Baltimore, jurors became friends and discussed the case on Facebook. I thought that was very interesting. Although the rules say that you're not supposed to discuss the case outside of the jury room, they created a chat area where they could talk about it online. And this guy, the witness, there was a mistrial where the plaintiff was caught sending texts during a sidebar to a witness who was still on the stand, also an instance where there was a waiver of attorney-client privilege where the attorney was texting his client during, actually during a deposition. So we're going to talk about attorneys and juries. And then we're done. So attorneys, friending. Can you friend somebody in order to get information, especially if they know the opposing party? It is unethical to friend even through an agent under false pretenses using a fictitious name or if it's a represented party. In those cases, you can only view the public information. Universally, that is the rule. But what about non-parties? Seems to be a split of opinion there. Philadelphia, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts say that you cannot friend without disclosing the purpose and the association with the lawyer. Otherwise, it's tantamount to deception by omission of material fact. New York City and Oregon say that you can ask to be a friend without that disclosure, although the city of New York uh, defines a party very, very broadly. It's not a technically a party to the litigation, but it's any representative witness, potential witnesses, and others with interests or rights at stake. All right? So what about directly by the party or the client themselves? You as an attorney can't do it. Your agent can't do it. What about the party or the client themselves? You would think that the answer would be no. There is one opinion out there in San Diego that said yes. Nothing would preclude the attorney's client himself from making a friend or request to an opposing party or a potential witness, although it presumably would be rejected since the recipient knows the client by name. The kind of attorney deception which the courts disapprove is the exploitation of a party's unfamiliarity with the attorney's identity and adversarial relationship to the recipient. So... <laughs> And this brings up, you know, what happens if you're working with a corporation? You have somebody in the mailroom bring somebody. That person's not going not gonna to know that, you know, the person in the mailroom. So anyway, there is one, at least one opinion out there that says there may be something that 
uh, you can do there. <laughs> Best practice, stay away from it. All right, and juries, and this is, this is going to be the end of it. So uh, the U.S. Judicial Conference proposed model jury instructions in 2009. It says you may not communicate while you're on the jury. Listen, Blackberries, Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, etc. There are other states in the U.S., California included, that also says that you cannot conduct any research. And California passed a law clarifying the judge's consent authority if someone on the jury does. In 2011, there was an article by the American College of Trial Lawyers that had some proposals of how to educate jurors, how to keep them from doing this thing that jurors are doing and is costing the judicial system a lot of money because of the mistrials. Warning, included with a summons, have them sign a written acknowledgement, send a sample letter that they can send to their friends and family. The court holds on to devices while they're in the courthouse. It does stop short of recommending contempt if they violate the instruction, but as you saw in California, there was a law in, uh, 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 solidifying the contempt authority, and there was a comment in 2011 by Judge Shinlin that went even further. She said, I'm keenly aware that there are convictions set aside all over the country as a result of jurors looking up information on the Internet. We in the judiciary have been discussing this. And what I might do is write a pledge that the jurors are required to sign, promising they won't turn to the web. Those who do sign will be subject, not, not the contempt, but the perjury charges if they broke the agreement. Pretty significant there. All right, so what about talking to jurors? After the trial, less strict regulations. During the jury selection or trial, there is one uh, reported decision, mistrial where the juror falsely denied having prior litigation history, and the trial court criticized counsel for not performing Internet research on the juror. So what can you do generally, according to these opinions? You can passively monitor the public information of the juror. You cannot friend through deception, you know, kind of the same rule that we saw before. But where the juror, ha and you can't do anything where the juror becomes aware of the monitoring. And as we know, some of the webs, the social media websites, tell them when someone has looked them up. And LinkedIn does that. It says somebody has looked at your profile. If that's the case and identifies you as the attorney or your agent, then you cannot do that as well. Uh, need to be aware of all of the technologies and what the ramifications are if you do reach out to friend somebody, for example, or do other investigations with someone on the jury. So to wrap it up, don't forget also in the Casey Anthony case, oh, the attorneys monitored 40,000 sites in order to incorporate and react to negative comments and weave public sentiment into the courtroom strategy. So in that instance, that's the first one I had heard of of someone doing that. They use social media, they use the web to enhance their representation and their defense of uh, Casey Anthony. So that does it for social media. Here's the 10 don'ts of e-discovery again. I'm going to pass it back over to Billy. He's got some uh, final comments. I think he's going to put you into the poll, and then we will come back for questions. Great. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you walking us through. Uh, those 10 don'ts. So as, as Mike mentioned, going to launch up that final poll question here. Um, certainly want to keep the, the webinar educational in nature, but uh, obviously we're talking about e-discovery here, and LexisNexis can certainly help. So if you'd like to uh, speak with a LexisNexis rep representative about how we can help with e-discovery, uh, please select your preference there, yes, no, already a client. And we'll leave that open for about uh, just a few seconds here. It looks like we've already got um, about 50% of you voted. Also, this is a great time after you've submitted your answer here uh, to go ahead and submit any questions. Uh, we are going to stay on the line for a couple minutes to answer any questions that do come in. All right. So it looks like we've got um, just about everyone, so we'll give it about five more seconds here. All right, great. Thank you for participating. Okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and transition into the Q&A portion. Uh, and Mike, to get you started, it looks like we had one question come through uh, back during the meet and confer section, and it was, what do you mean by the term load file? 
Load file. Very good question. All right. A load file is something that can be ingested directly into a review file. Uh, you're starting out with native files, native documents. You've got Word documents, you've got PDFs, uh, you've got email, PSTs, right? All of that typically has to be processed. And once it's processed, it's put into a form, which they call a load file, that can be easily ingested into a review platform. Hope that answers the question. That is somewhat of a term of art, a load file. If you have, if you plan to use a particular review platform, you could ask the opposing party, as long as you're processing this information, why not just give me a load file that I can use on my system? And what it does is it prevents you from having to take the information that they send to you, the TIFF Plus, for example, if they give it to you in that format, and process it into a load file. So, very good question. Good deal. Well, we're uh, just a minute or two over the hour here, so we'll go ahead and, um, and wrap up for today. Certainly wanted to thank all of you for joining today's webinar. Um, certainly appreciate you, Mike, for walking us through that um, with a lot of great detailed information. So from that end, certainly feel free um, to reach out to me directly with any questions. My email is William. Burnett, B-U-R-N-E-T, at LexisNexis.com. Uh, and certainly hope you can join us again for a future webinar. But uh, thanks again for joining us, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you, Billy. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time. Thank you. Please stand by.